This is the digestive system. The basic functions of the digestive system are to intake food, break it down, and expel the resulting waste products. The components of the digestive system is the alimentary canal, which is also called the gastrointestinal tract, and it's its accessory digestive organs. The accessory digestive organs are the salivary glands, the tongue, the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. So with the salivary glands, we have parotid glands, which are usually on the cheek. We have sublingual glands, which are usually under the tongue. And then we have submandibular glands, which are right underneath the mandible. And the tongue is not just a flat structure like everyone believes, it's actually really deep down into the mouth and it's connected by other muscles that result in either voluntary or involuntary movement and structure. The pancreas, all the way down here, has ducts that connect to other various organs. And this helps with insulin production, glucagon production, which just helps regulate blood sugar from when you do eat. And then the liver, which has millions of functions that we'll get into later on. And the gallbladder, which assists both the pancreas and the liver. So when you eat food, it's gonna come through your mouth and then your teeth will break it down into a bolus, which is like a ball of food. Your tongue will help keep the food in the middle of your mouth and then push it down your pharynx, which goes down all this part, down into your esophagus. Your cardiac sphincter will open up into your stomach, which will push it down into your pyloric sphincter, which opens it and allows it to go into the duodenum of the small intestine, which goes into the jejunum of the small intestine, which comes out the ileum of the small intestine. Through the digestive system, there's digestion processes, which include ingestion, propulsion, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion, absorption, compaction, and defecation. Ingestion is just eating food. Propulsion is moving food throughout the body. Mechanical digestion is segmentation, which is mixing. Chemical digestion is breaking down the food that you have into chemicals and other useful tools for the body such as glucose and stuff like that. Um, absorption is what you intake when you eat. Compaction is making it tight, dried out, and able to move out of the body through defecation. So an important structure of the digestive system is the peritoneum. The peritoneum has two different parts. The visceral peritoneum, which is actually covering the organs itself, and then the parietal peritoneum is actually lining the cavity of the digestive system. And then there's the mesentery, and that's a double-layered peritoneum, and that lines the abdominal cavity. The alimentary canal is what makes up the digestive system. It begins at the esophagus and goes all the way through and ends at the anus. It begins with the innermost layer, which is the mucosa. That's the mucous membrane, it's the um, innermost layer. It is consisting of goblet cells and they secrete mucus. They are made up of uh, hormones and enzymes and that allows peristalsis to occur. And um, it also houses the malt uh, mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. And now the next layer in is the submucosa and that is made up of areolar connective tissue. And then the next one is the muscularis externa, and that is uh, made up of the inner circular muscle. The next layer is the serosa, and that is made up of the simple squamous epithelium. It's also called the visceral peritoneum. The alimentary canal it also has a nervous system in it called the enteric nervous system. It's made out of enteric neurons, which create the intrinsic nerve plexus and the extrinsic nervous regulation with the enteric nerve plexuses. The intrinsic nerve plexus is made out of the submucosal nerve plexus and the myenteric nerve plexus. The submucosal one is found within the submucosa of the alimentary canal, which regulates di the digestive glands and muscular mucosa. The myenteric nerve plexus controls the muscularis externa, which is in charge of segmentation and peristalsis. Segmentation is the mixing of the the components inside the digestive system and peristalsis is the movement. The extrinsic nervous regulation with enteric 
nerve plexus is basically the sympathetic and the parasympathetic motor neurons. The sympathetic system lowers digestive activity and the parasympathetic motor neurons raise digestive activity. The mouth is also called the buccal cavity or the oral cavity and its general functions is to chew food, moisten food with saliva, and then help you swallow food. The mouth is made of the lips and the cheeks, which keep the food between your teeth as you chew. It's made up of the red margin, which is the red part of your lips, the labial frenulum, which is the piece that connects your lips to your mouth, the vestibule, which is the pocket between your lips and gums, and the oral cavity proper, which is inside the teeth and the gums. The next part of the mouth is the palate, the hard palate, made of the palatine bone and the palatine process of the maxilla, the soft palate, which is a muscular layer, the uvula, which closes the nasal pharynx when you swallow, the palatogalosso arches and the palatopharyngeal arches, which together make up a structure called the fossies. And the fossies simply anchor the palate to the tongue. The tongue has the functions of repositioning the food between the teeth. It's made of the lingual frenulum, the under the tongue part, the papillae, and there's several types of papillae, filiform, fungiform, circumventilate, sulcus terminalis, intrinsic muscle, intrinsic muscle, and lingual tonsil. The histology of, sal of the salivary glands called serous, typically made out of water and enzymes and mucus. To continue with salivary glands, there's different types. The extrinsic salivary glands are the parotid, the submandibular, and the sublingual. They're mostly made of mucus cells. Mumps is a disease also known as parotitis, which is inflammation of the parotid gland. The other type of gland is the intrinsic or the buccal glands, and they're patches of serous and mucus glands scattered in the throat. Saliva is made out of primarily water, salivary amylase, which breaks down starch, Mucin, which is a protein, almost like instant mucus solution. Lysozyme, which kills bacteria. And IgA, which fights bacteria. To control salivation, our mouths have chemoreceptors and pressure receptors, which stimulate them within the mouth. Also what stimulates salivary glands is the sight, smell, thought, or the thought of food. And when it comes to our nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, or the fight or flight system, dries up your mouth because you don't need to control saliva while you're either fighting or running away from your life. Dehydration decreases salivary production and one key identifier of low saliva production within your mouth is halitosis, which is another way of saying bad breath because your mouth isn't moist and bad bacteria can reproduce. You have permanent and decidus teeth and decidus teeth is just another way of saying baby teeth and there are different types of permanent teeth. In total, you have 32 permanent teeth. Incisors, which cut your food. Canines, which tear and pierce your food. Premolars, which is another word for bicuspids. And molars, which grind and crush your food. The formula for your teeth is 2I, 1C, 2PM, 3M, times two, which is saying two incisors, one canine, two premolars or bicuspids, and three molars times two, and that's the total amount of adult teeth you should have in your mouth. The tooth is made up of the gingiva, which keeps your teeth in your bone, so your gums, and the actual tooth itself is made of the crown, the neck, the root, and the pulp cap, the root canal, apical foramen, and the periodontal ligament. The crown is the part that you see out of your mouth, the exposed piece. The root is down in the bone. The pulp cavity is the space of blood vessels and nerves within your tooth, and the root canal is the passage from the pulp cavity to the apical foramen. And the periodontal ligament anchors the tooth to the socket of your alveoli. Your tooth is made up of enamel, dentin, cementin, and pulp, and it goes just as follows. Enamel, dentin, cementin, and pulp. Clinical problems that can come from having bad teeth are cavities, also called dental caries, tartar, which is calculus, gingivitis, which is pockets of infection, and periodontal disease.
Cavities come from when the mouth dissolves your enamel. Tartar comes from calcified plaque or a combination of plaque and bacteria from carbohydrates and food. Gingivitis comes from plaque that can cause open spaces in your teeth and gums, and periodontal disease is just tooth loss, mostly associated with meth mouth. The greater momentum is a membrane that attaches to the stomach, to the organs that surround it. The mesocolon attaches large intestine to the parietal peritoneum, and the lesser momentum attaches to the liver. After that, we have the muscularis externa, which is a longitudinal layer, a circular layer, and an oblique layer. Longitudinal runs up and down, circular runs circular motions in a circle, and oblique runs at an angle or diagonal. All these help to mush up and mix up food. Next, we have the histology of the stomach, which is lined with mucus cells. These mucus cells are also lined with gastric pits, which are depressions or bladders that lead to gastric glands. All in all, when it comes to the stomach, we have about, we have way more than three chemicals, but three major chemicals in the stomach are gastrin, secretin, and CCK for short. Gastrin is released in response to the sight, smell, and thought of food within the stomach. Se secretin is, re is released in response to acidic chyme in the duodenum, which is the first portion of the small intestine, and CCK is released in response to fatty chyme in the duodenum. There's all these, there's their targets, and then their actions. So gastrin targets the stomach and the small intestine, which both increase motility, which is movement, or like the rumble in your stomach that makes your stomach move and stretch. Um, and in the stomach, it also increases the production of gastric juice. In the liver, CC, uh, secretin increases bile production. In the pancreas, it increases bar the production of bar carbonate rich juice. And in the small intestine, it decreases motility, which makes a slowdown movement. CCK targets the pancreas, gallbladder, and sphincter odi. In the pancreas, it increases production of enzyme-rich juice. In the gallbladder, it makes it contract and push out bile into the small intestine. And the sphincter odi, it causes it to open up and allow small passageways of bile into the duodenum for digestion. Of the gastric glands, we have the parietal cells, which produce intrinsic factor. They absorb vitamin B12, and that's that, those are the only cells that absorb vitamin B12. HDL um, is another part of intrinsic factor. It helps break down proteins and act activates pepsinogen. And when pepsinogen is activated, it turns into pepsin. Like, that's when we further call it pepsin. Chief cells, or zymogenic cells, are produced from pepsinogen turning into pepsin and digesting proteins, so when you add HCL. With parietal cells, those produce intrinsic factor, which helps us absorb vitamin B12, which we can't absorb on our own. And they also make hydrochloric acid, or HCL, which breaks down proteins and act activates pepsinogen. And after pepsinogen is activated, we just call it pepsin. Enteral and endocrine cells make gas the gastric hormone that we just spoke about up here on the board and it's produced by the G cells in the stomach. With the internal and endocrine cells, histamine, which is produced by histaminocytes, increase the production of HCL. Increased production of HCL makes increased production of pepsin. So more protein breakdown. For the last portion of the stomach, there's clinical problems. There's only three that are outlined, and to help you remember them, we drew diagrams for each one. Emesis or mesis is basically just vomiting to the person throwing up its little chunks of corn and different types of fluids. Gastritis is inflammation of the stomach line, and gastric ulcers is erosion within the stomach caused by bacteria. So if you look in the book or right here, you can see this is a hole in the stomach lining and then erosion on the stomach walls. This causes weak spots, which can be very painful because the stomach is very acidic. In the small intestine is also where most of your nutrients are absorbed or reabsorbed. Propulsion, or peristalsis, is the movement throughout the small intestine. The gross anatomy and structures of the small intestine is the plicae circularis, which are the circular folds of the intestine. This increased surface area. 
The mesentery proper, which connects the, the small intestine to the wall of your body. And for the subdivisions of the small intestine, we have the duodenum. This is about the first 23 feet of the small intestine. Submucosal glands, which pr produce mucus, provide a buffer for acidic substances. The duodenal ampulla, or the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and also is called the ampulla of Vader. The jejunum, which is about the next eight feet of the small intestine, it connects the duodenum to the ileum, and then the ileum is about 12 feet long, and it ends at the ileosacral valve, which is the next part is the seat bone. This all is called the pyrus patches. Right in the middle of each one is called the germinal center. This is where the activity happens. And right here is the muscularis externa, which is what they're connected to. Up top, these are called the domes. And then in between, you have the villi, and each villi has microvilli, which increase surface area. And these are like the finger-like protrusions. Gross anatomy, let's start off with the tenia coli. The tenia coli is a band of smooth muscle that goes all through the large intestine. Haustra is the pocket-like sacs that are on either side of the tenia coli. Uh, one is called haustrum and two or more is called haustra. There are epiploic appendages that would be uh, running along here. And that is just fat lobes, and they hang off of the large intestine. This, this picture is not featuring any epiploic appendages. Vermiform appendix, or just the appendix, um, that is sitting between the large intestine and the small intestine. It contains lymphoid tissue, and there is not a real known function for it. Another thing that isn't featured in this picture is the mesocolon. But um, imagine a mesentery sheath, and that is what attaches this large intestine to the abdominal wall. It's a pouch, and it is in the beginning of the large intestine. And uh, in between that is where the ileum and the cecum meet, and where it turns into the cecum is the ileocecal valve. And the ileocecal valve regulates passage of material from the small intestine to the large intestine. The other subdivision is the colon, and that is basically all these different types of subdivisions running through the large intestine. So here is the ascending colon, this is the transverse colon, descending colon, and then the sigmoid colon is where it bends, and then it meets to the rectum. So the internal anal sphincter here, that is involuntary, and it's made of the smooth muscle, and you can tell the difference between that and the external. Now that's made of the skeletal muscle, and that's completely voluntary, so you keep the feces away until you're ready for defecation. Haustral contractions occur every 30 minutes or so. So the contraction moves from one haustra to the next. Then there is mass movements, or called mass peristalsis. That's three to four times a day of moving. In that, there's the gastrocolic reflex, and that is actually what inhibits those mass movements. Okay, so there are about five general clinical problems that happen in the large intestine. We're going to start with hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids is uh, actually when the anal veins become stretched out. And you can see that here, how it progressively gets worse. The next is diverticula. The clinical problem diverticula is actually herniations or pouches that develop in the large intestine. A good reasoning behind it is because of a lack in fiber. Now there's diarrhea, and diarrhea is not enough water, H2O, being reabsorbed in the large intestine, and that is causing loose stools. Constipation is too much water absorbed, and the stool is dry, compact, and hard to move. And last but not least, food poisoning, or salmonella. This can be caused by poultry, chicken, turkey, eggs, or reptiles. It invades the walls of your intestine, 
So it is invading the walls of your intestine and it sits in you and kind of just lives there and grows bacteria. There are four accessory organs of the GI tract. One being the salivary glands and that consists of the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual glands. And the second accessory organ of the GI tract is the liver. The most important gross anatomy is the four lobes. Left lobe, right lobe, caudate lobe is here, quadrate lobe is here, and falciform ligament. Functions of the liver, metabolic regulation, hematological regulation, bile synthesis, it removes nutrients from blood and processes them. It stores glycogen, it stores fat, and synthesizes cholesterol. Uh, breaks down proteins to amino acids, stores vitamins and minerals and iron, uh, processes bilirubin, forms plasma proteins, and it produces bile. It features the central vein, which will drain out to the IVC. It has the portal triad which is made up of the hepatic portal vein, the hepatic artery, and the bile duct. The bile duct carries the bile away from the lobule, and that is down a bile canaliculus. That's how it carries away. The sinusoids are the spaces, and the hepatocytes are the liver cells. So, as we know, um, bile is, is made in the liver. There are two different types of compositions of it. There are bile salts. The main thing about it is that it's derived of cholesterol. The job of bile salts is to emulsify fat, and the bile salts are recycled and reused in the liver. There's also bilirubin, and that gets the yellowish pigment from the hemoglobin. Urobilinogen is the brown pigment in feces. So now that we understand the types of bile that are composed in the liver, we can speak about the clinical problems there is hepatitis A or B, and that's inflammation of liver. So hepatitis A is regarding like a busboy didn't wash his hands, for example, and now he's making everybody sick. Hepatitis B is a bloodborne pathogen, and it's chronic. Another clinical problem is cirrhosis or portal hypertension. It's when you drink too much and your liver becomes hard. Jaundice is when you turn yellow and the bilirubin in your liver is backing up. The gallbladder sits beneath the liver. The function of the gallbladder is to store and concentrate the bile. The cystic duct connects the gallbladder to the common bile duct. The hepatic duct connects to the liver. There's a sphincter of odi and that regulates the flow of bile and pancreatic juice in the small intestine. Below the gallbladder is the pancreas and the duodenum. And the clinical problem, cholelithiasis, is gallstones in the gallbladder. The pancreas contains excrine and endocrine parts. Excrine secretes 1500 milliliter of pancreatic juice into the duodenum daily. Endocrine secretes hormones directly into the bloodstream. There are glucagon insulin, and somatostatin. Glucagon increases when insulin is low. Insulin decreases the blood glucose level. Somatostatin decreases the blood flow to the GI tract. There are four structures of the pancreas. Head of pancreas, tail of pancreas, main pancreatic duct and accessory pancreatic duct.